So these are the key questions as we uh, look at the reverse shoulder arthroplasty. And here's Christian Gerber, who uh, one of my mentors and friends many years ago. How important is the subscap in the first place in reverse shoulder arthroplasty? I recall in the very beginning there were some concerns that the subscapularis in the setting of reverse shoulder arthroplasty may be a contributor to instability, uh, and so many of us would routinely ignore the subscapularis in the setting of reverse shoulder arthroplasty. Uh, that thinking and dogma has obviously changed today. Uh, and so this uh, remains one question. And the second question is, to what degree does repairing the subscap have an effect on the overall functional outcome of reverse shoulder arthroplasty? Are we perhaps overpowering the remnant uh, short external rotators, the teres minor, remnant of infraspinatus? Uh, these are still unanswered questions. And uh, as we move to the arthrex reverse system, it's, uh, as we know, the only uh, implant design which gives the surgeon the option of having a more Gramont-style horizontal angle of inclination of the humerus versus the 135 degree more anatomic design. So what impact does this uh, geometry have on our subscap repair? And then I want to touch a little bit on technical pearls and obviously post-operative rehabilitation, which also plays a role. So we know from uh, various uh, contributors that the subscapularis is the largest rotator cuff muscle. It accounts for 54% of rotator cuff volume. And it uh, is not only an internal rotator, as we, as we know, but it also acts to compress the joint and optimize the function of the remainder rotator cuff throughout our arc of function. It optimizes function of the deltoid and uh, the uh, posterior rotator cuff and overhead motion. It provides a fixed fulcrum of rotation relative to the glenoid. But how important are these features in the reverse, which is a very constrained uh, articulation? So we know in non-constrained shoulder arthroplasty, the subscap is critical. It's critical in functional improvement uh, following shoulder arthroplasty. Insufficiency can lead to both static and dynamic uh, anterior subluxation of the humerus. Uh, this can lead to glenoid eccentric loading, potentially loosening, rocking horse effects, poor coordination of deltoid contraction, ultimately pain and dysfunction. And so, as Evan showed earlier on the axillary lateral, it's quite uh, easy to appreciate subscapularis insufficiency with static uh, anterior subluxation of the humeral component. It's a common cause of revision, and the reports in the literature have indicated this uh, occurrence. The, uh, the physical examination to assess the subscap uh, is uh, well described, and I like to use lag signs uh, to assess this. The modified liftoff test uh, is a very useful test for the examiner, uh, and for patients that have difficulty getting behind their back, the, the, the uh, modified belly press test can also be an internal lag sign, which can nicely document the presence or absence of subscapularis integrity. Uh, imaging is very useful, and at least in my hands, a CT scan is a routine part of uh, preoperative planning for shoulder arthroplasty. And aside from really appreciating glenoid version and retroversion, which uh, is uh, most reliably quantified on CT scan, I'm also trying to get a sense of the rotator cuff before getting into the operating room and, and primarily looking at the subscapularis. And so when we get into a setting based on Goutalier's staging system, of stage three or four fatty infiltration, uh, we're probably not going to be considering a non-constrained shoulder arthroplasty and going right to reverse. Uh, the surgical technique uh, includes beach chair positioning. I like interscaling catheter placement, which allows for relaxation uh, during and uh, post-operative analgesia. Uh, various approaches have been described for the reverse, including a superior approach, uh, which uh, is not an approach that I uh, will uh, use, uh, and an articulated arm holder is also quite useful. Uh, as we all know, in shoulder arthroplasty, the releases are really the critical step. And when we're thinking about the subscapularis, I think it's, a, it's very important to uh, release those adhesions deep to the conjoint tendon. Uh, and uh, a biceps tenodesis for me is a routine part of the operation. Now, when we get to the subscapularis, uh, I think it's important, as been, has been highlighted earlier, to release the rotator interval to the base of the coracoid. And once we identify the axillary nerve, uh, it's uh, much more safe and effective to perform a 360 degree release of the subscapularis. Now the takedown itself uh, really are, there's really three methods uh, and I will say that uh, I've never had a good uh, appreciation or, or uh, affinity for a uh, medial takedown. Uh, conceptually, I've uh, had an issue with cutting through native uh, tendon and so for me at least, the lesser two brassi osteotomy is something that I learned in Switzerland many years ago. Uh, and it's not only used in shoulder arthroplasty, but I remember operating next to Dr. Gons. Uh, he would routinely use lesser two, or, uh, lateral uh, vastus lateralis osteotomies for uh, hip exposure. And so we have the takedown, we have the peel down technique, which probably gives the surgeon the most variability and flexibility with how they want to repair the subscap, and that's my uh, preferred method of choice today. 
Uh, and then obviously the lesser tuberosity osteotomy. And so the advantages of the LTO have been described and reported in the literature. Uh, we, we talked about Peter Millett's work and Brent Ponce's work. Bone to bone healing is obviously preferred versus tendon to bone healing. Uh, and so biomechanically, at least the strength of repair uh, has been espoused to be improved, although the more recent work by Evan Letterman in the lab has shown that perhaps it's equivalent to a more robust uh, soft tissue technique going through the actual prosthesis. So uh, a, a subscapularis release, uh, a 360-degree release is effective, and I think that one of the uh, pearls which is very helpful is releasing the subscap from the anterior scapular uh, body. And so I like to take some curved mayos uh, or a cob to really release this all the way down, and so this gives us free lateral excursion of the muscular tendinous unit under traction, which gives us a little bit more flexibility where we want to repair the subscap based on the geometry of the reverse. So we talked a little bit about the, the design features of the uh, Arthrex reverse, and so... Uh, there's uh, still uh, some variation in thinking. What are the decision? Uh, what's the decision-making process for a surgeon to choose one orientation or the other? I will say that with a 135-degree cut, we have a larger footprint or preservation of the lesser tuberosity, and so at least on that note, it might be a preferential. Uh, we also find that with uh, glenospheres placed in more lateral offset, like the plus four design, we're lateralizing the center of rotation, and so the, the combination of a more distal center of rotation with lateralization can oftentimes increase your tension on your subscap uh, and during your up subsequent repair. And so at least in my hands, uh, I like to uh, take a, a, a a repair technique which involves uh, bone tunnels through the lesser tuberosity and surclaws the sutures around the stem. And for me, that has been a very robust repair with uh, added flexibility. Uh, rehabilitation uh, is uh, relatively straightforward, uh, and uh, so we just need to protect that until we move to a minimally invasive technique down the road, hopefully uh, sooner than later. So uh, this is a patient of mine uh, from many years ago who had had two failed rotator cuff repairs. We see evidence of rotator cuff tear arthropathy, proximal migration, advanced fatty infiltration, good preservation of bone stock, and she did relatively well with, in this case, a 155 degree angle of inclination, standard glenosphere, and did relatively well. Uh, we reported on uh, my early experience of the reverse uh, beginning in 2005 in 265 consecutive reverse total shoulders, and we were able to review 239 of these patients with a mean follow-up of uh, just over two years. Uh, as expected, we found significant improvements in pain and function post-op. Uh, the revision rate uh, was uh, 8%, which included primarily instability, and this really reflected our early experience of the reverse in the United States. Uh, but what we found was that there was no correlation between subscapularis repair or not and uh, the evidence uh, or presence or absence of instability or functional outcomes. Uh, this study by Dr. Hawkins, who's here today, uh, he reported on 120 patients, 65 of which underwent repair of the subscapularis uh, in reverse shoulder arthroplasty, and in his hands, at least, found no correlation between subscapularis repair and the presence or absence of postoperative instability in the reverse shoulder. In contrast, uh, these two studies, one by Brad Edwards and the other by Greg Nicholson's group, uh, they did find a positive correlation between the presence or absence of subscap repair with reverse shoulder arthroplasty and the presence or absence of instability. However, if you look at these studies a little bit more closely, they didn't control for the diagnosis at hand, and so many of the cases of instability without subscap repair occurred in patients who had revision, hemiarthroplasty, or fractures, so other diagnoses which we all know are at increased risk of instability uh, to begin with. So in conclusion, I think that repair should be attempted as patients benefit from added rotation, internal rotation strength. I have not found it to be an issue as far as overpowering remnant posterior cuff, teres minor, and uh, remnant infraspinatus. I think ultimately the impact of the subscap repair continues to be somewhat controversial. We need to study this a little bit more closely. I think that repair with a 135 degree angle of inclination in the arthrex reverse setting, which seems to be the uh, choice uh, of most surgeons today is a more attractive repair for repairing the, the uh, subscapularis because there's greater footprint allowed uh, onto the lesser tuberosity and it's a, a more anatomic repair. However, if repair is not possible because either the excursion is not adequate or there's poor muscle or tendon quality, I, I think it's not something to worry about too much. It's a constrained articulation. I don't believe that it contributes to instability that much, so I don't worry about it too much. Patients will still benefit tremendously from her shoulder arthroplasty.